at this morning, and therefore we're going to be done with chapter 15 of Matthew and go into 16. That is my goal, even though I only have 30 pages left to go. No, no I'm just kidding. The, the interesting thing I find in these passages, as we go through this, one of the interesting things I should say, is that in the backdrop of everything is the, the idea that Christ is the very Word of God, teaching all about who God is because He is the very God in human flesh. So this, these kind of things are still happening all around what's, what's the narrative that Matthew's trying to present here. Remember, Matthew's narrative is not always in chronological order. But I believe, more than anything, that these two events follow each other. Uh, not only the idea of the uh, Syrophoenician woman getting her daughter healed from demon possession, but also the healings of the multitudes, which leads into the feeding of the multitudes. But here's the interesting thread that's going to run through this whole section all the way through 16. The idea of bread. I don't know how often bread comes up in your conversations. There's certain places I go because I just like the bread. We had a conversation on the golf course, Eric and I, about Cuban bread. About Cuban, Cuban bread, I don't know, y'all, I just got an issue, but Cuban bread is to die for. It's one of those great things that you can do, very versatile, and they don't make it in Oklahoma. And if you want to open a restaurant and make Cuban bread, Eric's going to help you. Because <laughs> it, it is not the easiest thing to do, but you can do some great things with it. And people will come for miles for two things, Cuban coffee and toast. The, the bread's great. The reason I bring this up is because man has to have bread to live. There are some people that that's all they live on is like bread. You know, I have different kinds of bread. And there are hundreds of different kinds of bread. My favorite bread, other than the Cuban bread, is bagels. bagels. And I could tell when a bagel is done right, and everybody goes, good old school bagel. That's not, that's good, but it's not bagels, okay? And it's hard when you grew up in the communities I grew in, there are bagels and there are Bagels, and then there's stuff they call bagels that have a hole in it in the freezer section of your local grocery store. It's not bagels. It would double as a hockey puck. The reason I'm bringing this up is because you think about bread and how important it is to sustain life. And that's what's going to happen here again in this incident because we have two incidents. We have the feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000. Both of them involve two things. And, and I don't know about you all, sometimes your lunches are just what it is, my, the idea of bread and fish, bread and sardines. How many of you ever had that for lunch? Bread and, or just sardines even. You know, like three people like sardines. That's probably why they're so cheap. I love sardines. I had them, I worked the post office 34 years. I had them almost every day for a, quite a while. I like sardines. I like them in whatever sauce, not sauce and whatever. And you go, why? Well, see, I think it's brain food. So smarter people usually eat it. At least that's what I was taught, right? But think about it. I want you to picture this. A piece of bread and a couple of sardines. That's your lunch. That's it. And that would barely feed some of you. I know some of you, and I know you would have a pound of fish. Let's do that instead of a sardine because most of you are repulsed by sardines. Um, there's also a thing in we call gefilte fish. Anybody ever have gefilte fish? It is not gefilte nor fish. I don't know what it is. It's, it takes a certain palate to have that stuff. Nobody's going to have that. The reason I'm bringing this up is because when we think fish, I want you to think small fish, bigger than a minnow, smaller than a trout. Okay? That's what we're talking about. And when we pick up in verse 33 in chapter 15, the disciples said to him, where would we get so many loaves in a desolate place to satisfy this great multitude? You know what they have? The disciples have a faith issue. Not a fish and bread issue. They have a faith issue. Where would we get some? Uh, I turned back a page, and they should have turned back a page. They were feeding 5,000. They said the same question. How can we do this? How much money would it take? And Jesus said, just find somebody. See what? Somebody's gotten, he found some little kid with a lunch, and I don't know how they worked it out because little kids don't easily give up their lunch. <laughs> you know, later the disciples said, you'll get more than this kid, let us have your lunch. Which is interesting because they didn't even count him as an attendee to lunch, they had counted the men, not the kid. And they took his lunch, and the disciples should have remembered that. So when we get here in chapter 15, it said, 
And, and notice that they said it's a desolate place. I cannot describe the country of Jordan any better than they just did. Jordan is desolate. There are places you will drive for miles and you say, man, isn't even a camel don't live here. It's like nothing for miles except all of a sudden you hit a speed bump. I don't know who thought of this way how to build roads in Jordan, but you'll hit a speed bump in the middle of absolutely nowhere. You look to the east of you, the west of you, north and south, and all you see is a speed bump. <laughs> like, did they have an issue out here? The reason I'm bringing it up, because I don't think many of us know what desolate area is. We'll, we'll get out to the panhandle and say, this is desolate because you don't see a house in like two minutes or something. You know? That's not desolate. Desolate means it's an arid, dry, kind of deserty place with nothing with nothing. And how do you make bread in a place that's got nothing? And we know that's not a good recipe for any kind of bread. But I think it's fascinating what the disciples were looking at in this desolate place, how to satisfy this great multitude. And my initial response is, what? Jesus just fed the 5,000, and they saw this. They not only saw this, let me tell you what they did. They brought, they found this kid, they brought this kid with the five loaves and two fish. Here's a comparison, five loaves, two fish. And they brought him to Jesus, and they picked up 12 baskets full. They were the servants that would serve the tables. Remember, they broke up in hundreds and fifties, if you remember the picture of out there on the, on the hilltop. And they would pick up 12 baskets full. That, that means each one of the disciples were put, bringing a basket back. Um, there's been arguments, and I'm going to say this as easy as I can. We'll deal with this a little bit more in chapter 16. I don't care about the baskets. I've heard, seen, I've heard and seen so many because there's two different words for baskets. There's the word here for baskets in chapter 15. That's a, a basket. And in chapter 14, it's a basket. Are they different? Probably. Probably different in material. Probably maybe a little different in size. And one even said something what I thought was interesting. One's in Gentile baskets, and one's a Jewish basket. And I said, what? <laughs> I don't know how you could come that up with the words. They are different Greek words. I will acknowledge that. I will acknowledge that. And I believe the one in this section we're looking at is a bigger type of basket because it's the same one that's used to let Paul down into the ha house, you know, get him out kind of thing, escape hatch. Uh, so it has to be a pretty good-sized basket to take Paul. I don't know how big Paul was. Average guy, 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, 197 pounds, I don't know, and lift him up. So it's got to be a – it can't be the little basket you carry for Easter. You know, this is my Easter basket. We all think small. It's got to be a basket. I think both baskets were enough to carry – I like when somebody said, this basket here, it has to do with carrying money. Oh, Yeah. I want a basket full of money. <laughs> My basket's this big, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's, 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 it's interesting, and don't let your eyes focus on the non-issue. That's a non-issue. And then they'll, they'll say, well, one was 12 baskets, which represents the 12 tribes, and here it's seven baskets, probably represent the days of creation. I don't know how you come up with that. It's, it preaches real well, but it doesn't say it. All it says, one's 12, one's seven. That's all. Don't, don't get lost in the minutia. Get, get lost in what's happening, and we need to do, do this because Jesus didn't want to send them away. He wanted to find a way to deal with it, and it was a faith issue with the disciples. That's all it comes down to. And it's a different crowd. And the disciples were probably a little less attentive because who cares if Gentiles eat? You know? And, um, I mean, it doesn't say that in the text, but that's kind of what you're going to get of the opinion of where the disciples are. But my interesting point that I think we need to reach out to and look at, how can the disciples find a way to solve the problem? <laughs> I just find it fascinating because they said, we can't ever satisfy everybody with bread in this area because it's desolate. We can't even find, you know, Haman's pita shop. It's not here. There's nothing here. We can't even get enough bread. And if they could, how, would you, how much money would it take to feed about 10,000 people? You ever think of that? I was watching a little special they have on West Point. I find this fascinating. They got to feed 
thousands of cadets three meals a day. How would you like that job? Feeding thousands of cadets, young cadets, and if you know anything about cadets, they're working out. It's summer PT. They're hungry. And, you know, a piece of chicken for everybody. You know, like everybody gets a nugget. That's not what's happening here. We're feeding thousands of people. So they got vats. They showed the kitchen. Vats of places to put food. Vats. One vat holds 100 pounds of broccoli. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, they're feeding lots of people. And Jesus has to feed upwards of 10,000 people. Where's his vats at? Isn't that a great picture? Would you see what's going on? But the problem, again, is not a physical problem. It's a spiritual problem. And I want you to be sure you get this. Because what would you do to feed that many people? And so, basically, this verse concludes with this idea. Look at verse 34. And Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? Well, it begins with that idea. This is Jesus' words to them. And if you look, if you have a red-letter Bible, that's all you get from Jesus. How many, words, how many loaves do you have? Now, we will see a scene later, and Matthew, Matthew and Mark are a little different. Matthew says they traveled across the sea with no bread. Mark will say with one loaf. I think that's, again, a, a little minor issue. But if you have 13 guys traveling across the Lake of Galilee and they only have one loaf, it's really not enough. It's like having nothing. And it probably, here's what happened. By the time it got to the shore, there was no more fried bread. What are we having for the ride? Everybody take a piece, quick. And it was gone. So these guys didn't carry bread with them. That's the point. And they probably even carried that bread because of what they pick up. I don't know where they, what they did with the extras at any point. Um, but we do know that they picked up enough to at least get something to take for the travel. But again, as we look at this faith issue, and I, I think it's important because he says to them, and they said seven, here's their answer, seven and a few small fish. I can't be any clearer than that. Seven loaves. And I don't care how you divide it. I don't care how you cut it. Seven loads is not going to feed, and it will say later, there was 4,000, verse 38, 4,000 men besides women and children, because women and children didn't count, get counted in a census. Just didn't. So you can easily double that and a little bit more, because back then they didn't say, oh, everybody's allowed to have one and a half children. You know, you, you could have as many um, there's an old statement, every man has a quiver full of children. And thank God every man has a different idea of what a quiver is. Okay? Some of my discussion with my wife when we were having kids, how many do you want? She says six, I'll take zero. So we split the difference. <laughs> so that was my quiver full. But some people just have a lot of kids, and I say, God bless them. <laughs> be a, buy a big car. <laughs> you know, you got to be dealing with this. Um, the reason I'm saying that is because we don't know how many people. There's probably upwards of 10,000 or more. People that were hungry, and you have seven loaves. I don't care how you make it from Cuban bread to French bread to a media noche kind of thing. You can't, you can't do the math. And two small fish. I'll give you this. Let's go this, okay? I know some of you gone fishing, and the fish keeps growing, but this is the fish we have, okay? I don't know how you can do the math and come up with that'll feed that many people and listen and satisfy them. The rule was for the disciples, we can't find enough in this desolate place to satisfy such a great multitude. Keep that in your mind. Satisfaction wasn't, oh man, I ate too much. I don't think I can move from dinner. But it was to the place where they were getting fattened from it. Remember, they hadn't eaten for three days. You kind of get what I'm saying? So it wasn't like, okay, that's a, okay, bite size, I'm good. Everybody's going to be fed. That's what they, th they looked at. And overcome the possibility of being faint kind of thing. So this is what he says. He, he directed the multitude, verse 35, to sit on the ground. I found that interesting. Because here's another thing that's different. Ready for this? He doesn't say put them in groups of 50 and 100. He just says, tell them to sit on the ground. And sitting on the ground is probably a horrible translation. It's more like recline, get ready to eat. Get in a position to eat. 
think of it as a pic. We're going to picnic. Get ready to eat. Now, some of you could sit cross-legged, and that's probably pretty good for you. I'm done with cross-legged. If I go cross-legged, I need help getting up. Okay? I, I don't know about you all, but I'm at the age I will lay down before I cross-leg anything. Okay? So we have this idea. They're, they're basically um, wait, waiting at their table they made on the ground. Waiting and waiting for a meal. Then it says, verse 36, And he took seven loaves of fish and gave thanks and broke them and started giving them to the disciples and the disciples in turn to the multitude. So Jesus says, I'm going to work on your faith issue. Here's how I'm going to work on it. I'm going to take the fish and keep doing this. I'm going to do this with the fish and the bread, and you guys are going to take it and distribute it, and I'm going to keep doing this. And the disciples will take the feed people, come back, go feed people, come back, go feed people. I don't know the logistics of waiting on tables of over 10 grand. I can't even imagine the Mater D that day who comes in, table for 10,000. I don't know if we could accommodate you. Find a spot on the hillside. Think about it. And say, wait a second, we had an influx of people. We really need to talk to the chef. Right? I mean, we all understand how logistics of restaurants work. Jesus was prepared for this, and the disciples were the, guess what, the mediators of this that would distribute this. And they would say, there's more? There's more? And they would continually do that, giving them out and giving them out and giving them out. And then it says in verse 37, and they all ate. I like the word all because it's an even playing field. It says they all ate. They all ate. And they were all satisfied. They were all ate. They were all satisfied. And we're done with lunch. I don't know how long it took or whatever meal it was at that time. It doesn't really matter. And here's what they, then they, the disciples, picked up what was left over from the broken pieces, seven Seven large baskets full. So the translators decided the word spurinos, which is here, this Greek word means a large basket. The one in uh, 15 means a basket that's large. I don't know what else to do with it. It's, 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 the basket in 15 is used to carry soldiers' equipment, too. So I don't know if it's quantitative difference. One said it's about two gallons, and I don't even know what a basket of two gallons looks like you know, twice the size of a gallon bucket. I don't know. <laughs> the problem is, the point that they're, we don't want to mess with the minutia, we want to look at what was happened. These disciples picked up leftover pieces from these loaves that they had found, these seven loaves and these two fish, they had leftovers. Leftovers. Remember we said the, the first class, when Jesus has compassion, he meets the need and then extends far past it. What was the need? The need was, I need a meal. I need a meal. They got a meal, and they saw something that was magnificent. They saw that it was leftovers from these. How did he do this? It's not magic. It's called a sign. It's called a miracle. It's called something miraculous because Jesus can only do this which is, again, pointing back to only, G, only God. Jesus is God. Only God can create bread out of nothing. Right? You try that one at home. I looked at the ingredients in bread and what it takes to make bread. I think bread's really hard unless you have... We used to have one of those things called a bread maker. Anybody have a bread maker? You throw all the stuff in there, and poof, you get bread. And some of the time, it's, that's heavy. That's not bread. <laughs> what is that stuff that came out of there? You know, then you got to worry about what elevation you are and all that stuff. I just say to make bread, it's easy. I go to the store, buy one. <laughs> but making bread, now making bread out of nothing, only God can do. And here's what we have. And here's what we see here. The whole idea here was to grow 12 guys' faith. That's, that's the initial thing. Because we don't see any interaction of anybody's faith. We don't see the what was the respondent from the crowd. We don't say the crowd stood up and said, 
thank you, Lord, for this food where you're magnificent, you're the God of heaven, or any, there's nothing. There's no response to the crowd. Now, I'm one of those kind of guys, I try and teach kids, because I deal enough with kids, to at least respond properly to an adult. Don't you like that? When a kid says, thank you, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. You guys like that, don't you? Respond properly. This is God of heaven who came down, took on human flesh, who is giving them spiritual food and physical food and nothing. Nothing. Not even really from the disciples, because the disciples will open their mouth in the next chapter and be stupider. Now, I want to be careful here, so I want you to understand something. The disciples, except for Judas, are all believers. They have to grow their faith. They have seen, listen, they have seen, they have believed, and they're also now at a point that having seen, they don't see anymore. There are certain things they've shut down spiritually. Whereas the nation of Israel hasn't seen and can't see, and they're being led by blind guides, and they're blind, and they're being led into a pit. Get the difference? This is so important. Because when we get to chapter 16, which we will do in a few minutes, you're going to see a difference. Okay? So here's what happens. It's simple. We get a simple narrative here. Verse 39. Sending away the multitudes. I don't know how that's done. Okay, guys, hey, get the heck out of here. He's sending them away. Jesus may say, I'm done. And I, the first thing goes through my mind, you're done, you're leaving? I'm following because you just fed me. Right? We all know where our bread is buttered. We find a place to follow because he's going to keep feeding me. This is good. <laughs> yeah, fish, but I don't have to work. But Jesus did something to send them away. The idea is that basically he kind of divorced himself from the scene. He sent them away. And he got into a boat. Maybe that's the easiest way. His boat's built for me. You all can't come in. <laughs> and sped off. You're not speeding off in those boats, but he went off and he went to the region of Magadan. Now, Magadan is where we get our, word, our idea of Mary Magdalene. That's where she's from. And um, Mark will deal with a different area, but it's, Mark is dealing with the, the arena, like the state. We have Oklahoma, and we live in Tulsa County. Let's do it that way. So we can look at this. Mag Mag Magadan is probably the county, and Dalmutha is the area. Um, so let me give you some lessons out of this because we're going to close up 15, 14 through uh, 15 right here. About faith. Let me talk about faith for a moment. First of all, faith is the idea, and I, I think this is kind of grossly misrepresented by a lot of people. Faith isn't magical. Like, where's your faith? And the first thing I would say is, I don't understand the question. What do you mean, where's your faith? Because it's kind of like you got to fill in what that means. Right? You with me? And you say, well, if you had more faith, you could move mountains. And you say, well, what, what does that mean? Now, first of all, that's never meant for any of you. Those that apply it to your life misunderstand something. We'll get to that later. But the idea of faith is not about just faith. I think it's a fully loaded, and it does carry a kind of a technical side. If you're here on Wednesday night, Mike dealt with what is technical and what's not. This is a little bit technical here. And it's just saying, basically, when you talk about faith, it's what's growing you and what should grow you. I love people to say, well, I have the Holy Spirit in me, which your believer does, and he will make clear what I need to know about the Word of God, and you never open up the Bible. That doesn't work. Your faith is not growing. Your faith grows when you interact with the Word of God, and here's the two-folded canon that's here. Jesus is the very word of God who's giving out the very words of God. You with me so far? And if they're not clicking with the words of God and by the word of God, their faith is not growing. And you have disciples that are kind of dense. They'll be called hard-hearted in a few moments. And he said, well, hard-hearted means those that are not believers. No, believers can be hard-hearted too. Know how I know that? I've met them. Right? A few of you are laughing. I don't know if you're the ones. <laughs> Believers can be hard-hearted because they don't spend time in the Word of God and want to know why their life is falling apart. And they say, well, I'm a believer. Good things should happen to me. No. No, that's not the formula. 
if you think good things happen to you just because you're a growing believer, you're misrepresenting the whole word of God. Paul was a really good believer. Everybody agree with that? Apostle Paul, good believer? Do you think he's famed for his belief? He did. A, he was persecuted and all that. And Lord knows he has a solid faith, okay? He's known for that faith. But Paul had information. It didn't come to him miraculously. You know, I used to go to college enough to know that some kids thought if they studied long enough by sitting on their book, they would get it by osmosis. God forbid they crack that book open and kind of study that stuff, right? So faith, listen, faith to grow in the correct, needs the correct food so that from within a man will come forth that which will not defile him. Man has to take in the food of God's word in order to grow. So I'm going to say this, application-wise, if you're not spending time in the Word of God, you're really much out of the will of God because you're not getting His Word in, and there's nothing to grow on. Think of it as seed to grow you and mature you as a believer. Spend time in His Word. Spend time not only in the Word, but taking it in and, and listen, plugging that in. Plugging it into your life. The disciples heard Jesus. Listen, the disciples had the greatest time ever in the advent of man. They spent three years, day and night, with the Messiah, who was teaching them the very word of God, teaching them the very words of God, and guess what? They don't get it. Peter will say something very godly in one set in 16, and then two minutes later in 16, he'll say, Jesus will look at him and say, Get thee behind me, Satan. Peter. In both places. Secondly, tradition does little for growth and little for your faith. And I will say this again in a church setting. People say, well, we have traditions. And if you don't hold to the traditions and do it this way, we're failing as a church and as a believers. We, there's traditions. And you just made, we've talked about it enough. You've made Tradition higher than the Word of God, but tradition never grows anybody. Tradition never overrides the Word of God. And sometimes tradition bangs into the Word of God, and people say, well, the tradition's better. It works. No, you're making it work. You're thinking it works. I grew up in a church that, God forbid, you weren't baptized. You were not obedient to the Lord, so you were disobedient. And the, the, all I would think is, maybe I'm going to hell because I'm disobedient. And I couldn't find one verse. Ever that would say if you got baptized, you were obedient. To what? Because it sells people say those things over and over again. If you say it long enough, loud enough, you believe it. I think Hitler said that. Right? Look what's going around today. There's so many lies being sold as the truth. I love that statement, right? Well, it's not my truth, it's your truth. No, I want to know what the truth is. There's only one truth. You know that, right? That's important. There's only one truth. And here's the truth. Jesus is who he claimed to be. Jesus will die on the cross soon after these ideas in Matthew and pay the penalty for sin in entirety. You're not involved in it. Jesus wasn't on the cross saying, Eric, in a couple of years I need your help because <laughs> I'm incapable. You understand? Thirdly, the disciples heard the parables of Jesus. They saw the soils of mankind. You look out, you could see the same thing they saw. Here's what Jesus does. He says, okay, here's the parables, and I'm going to take you to different vignettes, and you could look at the soil of mankind. Tell me what they're getting. And then figure out what soil you are, because the soil was a rocky place beside the road. I think a good rocky road was uh, Herod. Herod was a good example of being a rocky road. Uh, uh, beside the road, excuse me, beside the rocky road was probably the 5,000. 5,000 got fed, and they were done. They dispersed, didn't care. How about thorns? I think some of the 5,000 were thorns. Good soil? I think John the Baptist. Think he's good soil? John the Baptist is definitely good ground, right? Some of the disciples were good ground. They understood that when they were in the boat. Some of the disciples responded when 
Peter walked on water and Jesus came in, responding to him as the very God of all creation. They responded to him. So we have good examples of the soils. Fourthly, the disciples' grew, faith grew when they saw Jesus. When Jesus pulled Peter out of the water, when, when he met the needs of the people to eat, and when he felt compassion to heal the demon-possessed girl, they saw, they saw very clearly who Jesus was and their faith grew. Eyes on Jesus. So what about the Lord? What have we learned from these chapters about Jesus and the Lord, what he's done? First of all, Jesus healed people indiscriminately. I don't know how he does that. Um, I'm going to say something that's probably nasty, and you're all going to know something about me, and you'll hate me for lunch, okay? I discriminate. We all do. We all do some way or somehow. First, and we, you all know this, I, I'm a beast when I drive. Don't get out in front of me. The first thing I say is useless person. I just discriminated. Okay? We all discriminate. I discriminate. Right? I will never have liver. There's a discrimination there. Why don't you eat liver? It's edible. No. Just not going to eat that stuff. It's still moving when it's cooked. <laughs> it, you know, there's certain things we discriminate. We all discriminate. Jesus did not discriminate from anybody that had a malady. I think it's fascinating because he's... The compassionate and faithful God is right in the middle of the Lamentations. Lamentations is a book about the woe of Israel. And right in the middle, Jeremiah says that our God is a great God, full of compassion, loving kindness. Isn't that fascinating? So they learned something about Jesus. Jesus, secondly, never backed away from the Pharisees. These guys sought to destroy him, and Jesus with a breath could have made them smoldered pair of kids. He could have wiped them out. He could have just took them out. I don't know why he didn't, but he will. <laughs> there is a judgment day coming. Because I'm not that kind of guy. But Jesus did maintain that, that with them, the word of God was unimportant. With him, the word of God was the utmost importance. Now, Jesus is God who leaned wholly on the word of God. Remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? You remember that? Chapter 4, Matthew? You know what Jesus did? He quoted himself. He did. Because he quoted the word of God out of Deuteronomy. I don't know how many of you have done that. I'm really kind of rusty on memorizing the book of Deuteronomy. Nobody, you all got to memorize? No, you don't. But Jesus could take the words of Deuteronomy, plug it into a situation dealing with Satan, and say, this is where you're wrong. Because I read it in the word of God because I, participated in writing the Word of God because I am the very Word of God myself. But that's where he held it. It's, and I think we don't do the homage to this we should. This is very God speaking to us. I love people today to say, I want God to speak to me. Open up, read out loud. I've said it, I don't know how many times. People want God to give them something outside this book. He's going to give you nada. Nada, because he's given you enough for life and godliness here. Why would he speak more? What, are you somebody better than Paul? You know, I love people that say, and what gave you the credentials to get your apostleship? Because there's people that are called apostles today. Right away, mark them as false teachers, because it's not no such thing. God gave those gifts to the church. Those gifts are over. The gift of apostle and prophet, they're over. This is so significant, understanding the high esteem Jesus puts on the Word of God, because when we're talking about obedience, obedience to what? How about the Word of God? How about following the Word of God? See, man's rules and regulations or man's rules and regulations, they mean nothing. I know it's tomorrow we celebrate our Independence Day, and I'm excited. I love being an American. I couldn't think of myself anywhere else, even though the other day I was thinking Nigeria sounds pretty good. Because we got some crazy things going on in America, but it's wonderful to be an American. I grew up, I went to school, I was a patriot. I teach now where I'm a patriot. I've always been a patriot. I love red, white, and blue. It's great colors, except for some things, <laughs> you know. It's, it's you, you want to bleed for America, I think. But here's what I'm bleeding against in America. America doesn't care about God's word. It doesn't. And to make America care about God's word, you're trying to put that square peg in a round hole, and it's not going to work. 
So we've got to stand up for God's Word. And this is going to be really applicable to all of you. If you study God's Word, stand up for God's Word. Don't take what people are saying as divine revelation. Because most people are going to screw it up. I actually heard a guy blasting another guy who, both of them were idiots. I'm going to tell you, both, both ends were idiots. It was idiots fighting with idiots. But one idiot said, you know, we should kill all homosexuals. It's the most idiotic, stupid thing I've ever heard. So the other guy says, I don't know how you guys can believe in a God that wants all the homosexuals dead. How did he arrive at that? Both of them are idiots. The reason I'm saying that is because I stand up for what the Word of God says, and that is sin. Sin. Address it as sin. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to say, well, be accepting. I am accepting. It's sin. I accept it's sin. And guess what? You and I and everyone in this room sins. We can't fix the sin problem. Only Jesus already fixed the sin problem by dying on the cross. Okay? It's a sin problem. And I'm not going to give you any surprises, but sin's going to get worse. Nobody agrees with that? Okay. Sin's going to get worse. No, I know it's going to get worse. God flooded the world in Genesis chapter 6 because of sin. Is he close now? I want to say, yeah. I don't know how much worse it can get. But everything man did in chapter 6 was wicked. And out of all the world, he only found one family, one man named Noah, that found grace with God, one. I could say, at least in this room, we're doing a little better so far. It may come to that, but I will tell you this. You cannot use tradition to break the word of God. Once you do, that's evil. You all got that? And I think that's important. Thirdly, when we're talking about Jesus, and when we get out of understanding who he is, Jesus knows the heart of a man. John chapter 2, verse 25 says he knows the heart of the man. He still, but he still used God's word to convict the man of his thoughts. Think about that for a minute. That means God's words were used to convict a person. And even Jesus uses that formula. It's simple. Faith comes by and hearing by the Word of God. That formula doesn't change. You want to fix things as best you can? Just give people the Word. I don't care how you do it. I don't, don't take your Bible and hit somebody, though. I don't approve of that. And I don't know if that'll work, you know. But it, it's, even, even when Peter's preaching his first sermon, the words he used about the cross and the resurrection convicted somebody, and the verbiage that comes out of that, that they were convicted, the idea there is basically getting a two by four, a proverbial two by four upside your head. So if you use the Bible correctly in the words of God, you're hitting them with a two by four. And you don't have to be physical. They'll get it. Because the Holy Spirit uses the word to convict of sin, convict of righteousness, and convict of judgment. Use the word. And I think that's important because even Jesus did that. And Jesus did this. He came to fulfill the law. Remember we discussed about this? He came to fulfill the law. Now how he did it? He interpreted it correctly. How did the Pharisees fulfill the law? Look what I did. Look what I did. Look who I am. That's not working. Jesus also did keep the law, though. But he interpreted it correctly. Jesus also, even though he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, dealt with the Gentile, the nations, that is, healing the Canaanite's woman and feeding the five, 4,000. He dealt with the Gentiles right where they were at, whether individual or multitudes. He dealt with them. So when we talk about the church being Jew and Gentile together, well, that was always in the plan of Jesus. Always, Israel was the mediator nation. They were like those disciples. They were supposed to take the food from God. Remember the picture? The disciples were taking the food, and they're feeding the 4,000. Just picture that. Twelve Jewish guys feeding thousands of Gentiles. And I could just imagine what they were saying. Oi. 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 Right? Get that picture. 
But the nation of Israel was to do that, was mandated in Isaiah, many places in Isaiah, mostly chapter 60, that they were supposed to take the word of God and feed the nations. And what did Israel do? Just like Jonah. I got to go where? Not going. See you later. Hmm. But Jesus was the example. It said we could reach these people. That's what we're here for. Fifthly, Jesus being God, met man's needs, gave not only daily bread to the Hebrew people meeting their immediate need, but remember daily bread? This, this Pray this day for your daily bread. So the Hebrew people were there for one day, and they had the daily bread met by Jesus. And then he fed the Gentiles. But he met not only the physical need, but he was always there to meet their spiritual needs. Always. And we have to see that as we go through this narrative, especially as we go into 16, 17, and 18. Jesus, even though, lastly, Jesus, even though avoiding the onslaught from the blind Pharisees and the overly zealous Jewish crowd wanting to make him a king, remember we talked a couple weeks ago about they wanted to make Jesus a king, not the king, and there's a big difference between the and a, right? Because we already have a Herod, and a Herod has more a Herods. And there's more Herods, and Herods keep coming. Jesus to be the king would stop it right there. There's not going to be a secession of the throne. Jesus is always going to be king. With me? So it's different. If you say Jesus is a king, you put him in the Herod line when he was the king of David, and he was going to finish that line and be the king of Israel. So they were going after him to do that. He withdrew. He withdrew from them. He said, hey, <laughs> I'm just, I always find it fascinating. Jesus, the most publicly known person, and yet we don't have a picture of him because all the pictures you have today are horrible. Horrible. Everybody ever see a picture of Jesus? You never to, to see two of the same, do you? Unless they're what, photocopied? <laughs> you never see two of the same because people always got a rendition. I always stand in front of him like this for a few minutes going, doesn't look Jewish. Doesn't look Jewish. Some of them even looks a little effeminate, right? It's like, you know, I just did my hair. Mascara is just right. <laughs> what are you doing? Jesus would have kicked your butt for that picture. <laughs> Listen, he made a, a scourge, a whip. He made it, fashioned it, and beat him. So he, I could even see him in that incident in the tabernacle. He's making this little, what are you doing? Everybody said he was a carpenter's son. I think he was a good disciplinarian, okay? And he took that whip and he used it on people. The reason I'm bringing this up is because Jesus could have done anything to stop and thwart the Pharisees in the crowd. He did nothing. He did nothing except withdraw. And moved to a different arena. Same thing happened. He shows the same credentials. He had the same compassion, the same compulsion as he heads to the cross at Calvary. Nothing changed. And then we open up chapter 16. And I love how Matthew does this. He connects these two incidents together. Remember what I said a long time ago about the word and? Think of it as a, those couplings in a train. He's now putting these two cars together. And... The Pharisees and Sadducees came up. So Jesus is now moving from uh, a predominantly Gentile area into the area where a lot of Jewish people near his hometown of Capernaum. He's in Magd Magadan, Jewish town. We know that um, from all the records. So he comes into this Jewish arena. And again, Mark calls it Dalmuth, uh, Dalmanthia or something like that. Um, same place. It's like me saying Tulsa and Oklahoma. If you're in Oklahoma, you understand that Tulsa is also here, right? And he now confronts both the Pharisees and Sadducees. This is the first time since Matthew 3, 7, when John the Baptist confronts these groups that they're together. So this has got to be one of those things to say, well, hey, you're doing Bible study? Say, why are these two guys together again? They're the number one fan club against Jesus. They all had posters saying, we hate Jesus, we can't stand Jesus, we got to find a way to put, put him out of our sights and miseries and things that are going on. And, it, and in Mark's account, it's interesting. He says, he also adds the leaven of Herod. 
We'll see that later. We'll discuss it. It's not the Herodians. Somebody said, oh, the Herodians were there. Okay. Don't read things in the Scripture. The reason I say that is because the leaven of Herod is what Herod just did in the account in Matthew. We've, done, we've dealt with this. He put John the Baptist to death. That's the Herod they're talking about. Watch out for his leaven. Okay? But I think it's fascinating. So let's, let's read through Matthew 16, 1 through uh, 5, just real quick. Okay? Uh, hopefully we'll get through, well, a, a verse maybe. And it says, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees came up testing him and asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Add in there your comment. What you haven't seen enough? Right? How much more do you think they need to see? Jesus is well documented who he is. Everybody's told somebody about Jesus. Everybody's following him. Everybody's known what Jesus has done. But here's the kicker. Beware of dangerous words. You see the dangerous word in verse 1? A sign from where? Heaven. I'm going to ask you something. What's a sign from heaven and a sign from earth? How would you know the difference? I don't know. Just think about it. This actually means a sign out of heaven. Heaven's the source of the sign. Jesus already told them his origin is heavenly. I've come out of heaven. Jesus is the only one that had heavenly origin. None of you guys were like angels, and then when mommy had you, you became a child. There you're out. You weren't a being before you became, okay? So whatever your date of birth is, that's you. Well, probably in your row too. I'm good with that. Okay? That's you. Jesus had a pre-incarnate state. So he was sent by the Father, brought, put into Mary, Miriam, and she had a baby, okay? And the name was Jesus. Call his name Jesus, okay? But they want to see a sign from heaven, and Jesus should have looked at him and said, I am from heaven. I'm a good enough sign. You get what I'm saying? They were testing him, and they set him up for the test because here's what they're going to do. Simple. Jesus could do anything at that moment, and they would say, ah, that's not from heaven. Right? Because your, your truth is your truth, and my truth is what bright. And if you do something, I don't care what it is. I don't care what you do. Rain, fire, and brimstone, which should have happened. <laughs> it's not from heaven. It's from the atmosphere. We know the signs of the weather, and he's going to talk about it in a minute. Okay? So he goes on in verse 2. I'm, I'm not going through all the di uh, discussion of it. but And he answered and said to them, I love this. Jesus never answers them. Best way to deal with folly and fools is don't answer them. He says this, though. When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for you see the sky is red. In the morning, there will be a storm today, for you see the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky? Heavens, sky, heavens. You want to see a sign? Look up the heavens. You've already seen your sign. Red sky in morning, take what sailors take warning. Red sky at night, sailors delight. Biblical account, right? You all heard that, right? You know, that's not 100% right. It's close. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky but can't discern the signs of the times? What a fascinating statement. Then he says this to him. This is called politically correct statement. You evil and adulterous generation, you seek a sign, and a sign will not be given except the sign of Jonah, which everybody gets. Here's the sign of Jonah. What's the sign of Jonah? The resurrection of Jesus. Everybody's going to get that. Right? There's zero proof, zero, none, that Jesus did not resurrect from the dead. There's no body to prove it. There's nothing. Every proof that's there is Jesus resurrected from the dead. It's a sign everybody got. So you're not, they're not a special group. that They're the only ones that are going to get it. What he's saying is that sign will damn you to hell forever. But you're not going to believe that either. No matter what I do right now, and listen, this group is the same group. 
later Matthew will call them the chief priests, because that's basically what they are, will tell people to lie about Jesus' resurrection. That means it was their truth he didn't. But they couldn't prove a body. Listen, if they really wanted to prove Jesus was wrong, find the body. You want to find a body? He was on the shore having lunch with his disciples. There he is. There he is. You want to have proof? Want to have a body? He was walking on the road to Emmaus with a bunch of disciples. There's the body. Later, he'll be on the beach right before he ascends. 500 plus see him. You want to prove he's... Here's the body. You get it? Jesus didn't hide. Jesus didn't go somewhere and say, I resurrected, but I think I hide. He was out in the open. All they wanted to do was just get enough proof to make people stupid. Yeah, we might have seen Jesus, but that really wasn't Jesus. It was a hologram before they even came up with holograms. It's a holographic image. really wasn't Jesus. It was an apparition. Jesus is feasting on fish and food on the shore. He told Thomas to jam his hands in his side and put his fingers in his... That means he's real. You could do this. And Thomas said, nah, let's negotiate for something else. I'm not doing that. So he brings in these guys called the Sadducees. Let me just tell you about the Sadducees real quick. Without the jokes, okay? This is what they had in common with the Pharisees. Other than that, there's not a whole lot they had in common with the Pharisees. They had this in common. They hated Jesus. That's all. I can't find a whole lot more because when you talk about a, a discussion uh, religiously, they were on different pages. Uh, very little in common. If you say, what's the common ground religiously between the Sadducees and Pharisees, you probably say, well, they want pat on the back for what they are and who they are. That's about it. But here, here's the interesting. Uh, they're so, they were a social uh, religious party centered in Jerusalem, composed mostly of the priests and the Jewish aristocracy. They were the big shots. Their major belief was this. Ready for this? And you find this in the Bible because they didn't use it. Where at least the Pharisees had it as a book. Right? How many of you own more than one Bible? Just curious. How many of you, you have multiple Bibles? Okay, the rest of you aren't telling me the truth. Okay. Because I know in America you have at least one. Okay? They had the ability to have access to any of the scrolls. That's how religious they were. But they didn't believe in angels. No angels, no angelic beings, whether fallen or not fallen. No angels. No spirits. No spirits. None, which is kind of the same thing as angels. They didn't believe in a resurrection, so no matter what Jesus did, they didn't believe in it. They believed that the only thing would save you is if you did the temple rituals. All the temple rituals, they were all for that, and I don't know where they got it from because you can only get it from the Bible, and they really weren't that biblical. They believed that there's no afterlife. I don't know about you all, but if you told me there's no afterlife, party begins now. Right? I mean, seriously. Those of you who don't, don't get that probably have no, but I mean, think about it. No afterlife. No accountability. You die and become dirt or another lizard when you come back. I don't know. Whatever people think you become. No afterlife. Basically, they were, they, were, they were not biblical at all. And Paul discusses that in Acts chapter 23 if you want to see it. Um, so between them, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had issues with Jesus. So let me just finish this, this and we'll dis dismiss in a minute. They're mentioned in the New Testament 14 times. Always approaching Jesus in a negative man manner. Always. But here's what they had, their disagreements. The Sadducees placed unique authority on the Torah. Even though they didn't really hold to the Word of God, here's what they said. Those books of Moses are super important. Now, many of you have seen the movie Ten Commandments years ago, but there's a line in the Ten Commandments that they kind of held to. Ah, Moses, because it was all about Moses. Now, if you hold to just Moses, what they call the Torah, which is the five books of the Old Testament, Matthew, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that's all they held to. 
All the other things are just whatever. Just whatever. They recognize the prophets and other writings, but they just recognize it as part of the Old Testament. They did not feel these books provided any authoritative interpretation of law. Just Moses. Just Moses. Later, Jesus will tell the, the rich man that if you just had Moses, you have Moses and the prophets, you have enough information to give your brothers. You don't have to go back and talk to your brothers. Just Moses and the prophets. But he didn't say just Moses. Moses begins it. The prophets add to it. With me? So here's where it continues. Therefore, any doctrine could not be directly substantiated from the Torah. They rejected. In other words, if you said there's a doctrine or something and you found it in Isaiah, they say that's good, but it's not, in, it's not in the five books of Moses. We don't care. Right? How many of you read the five books of Moses? They begin the Bible. Most of you gas out at numbers, right? <laughs> okay. But most of you read Genesis a bunch of times, right? How much, how much theological understanding is there? Not a whole lot. And since the Pharisees, here's the dichotomy that goes between these two. Since the Pharisees maintained there was an oral Torah that was handed down from the traditions of the Father, which interpreted the whole Torah, Torah also means the whole Old Testament, they were in constant conflict. So think of a meeting with Sadducees and Pharisees. That'd be one to get in on. What's the agreement? We're both religious. We both hate Jesus. We're both going to test him. And that's where we're going to leave the story because that's all they have. That's it. And these two come together on attack to destroy Jesus. And we'll pick up with that next week. Father, we thank you for this time as we spent in your word. Again, many, much information here to grow our faith, to grow the disciples' faith, to hang on, to know that Jesus was truly who he claimed to be. Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.